Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Amy Kapczynski. I uh, teach law here at Yale, and I'm a faculty co-director of the Law and Political Economy Project, and very happy to be a co-host of this event with the LPE student group. And uh, welcome this incredible group of people here today. Um, so I'll just say a couple of words at the outset about why, particularly coming from the Law and Political Economy Project, I'm excited to have this group here. Um, one reason is that I was um, organized into a panel uh, uh, that covered a lot of this at Columbia a few months ago um, and by Rachel, who I think understood some of the connections between our work. Um, and it was really uh, an incredible uh, experience, one of the most, I think, intellectually and politically um, kind of vibrant um, things to happen to me in a law school recently. And so I thought we got to do this here. Uh, we got to bring this show on the road, bring it to Yale um, and bring this incredible group of thinkers and advocates together with our own Monica Bell, who will add, uh, uh, I'm sure, wonderfully rich things to the conversation. Um, so, but I wanted to just start out by saying, before turning it over to the main event, by saying two things about some of the connections between law and political economy work and the work of this panel that I think might not be so obvious to people who don't um, maybe um, follow closely what we're trying to do over in the LPE project. So broadly, the LPE project is an effort to try to um, uh, bring together um, and create some infrastructure for scholars, students, advocates who are all interested in questions of law and political economy, um, but broadly through a shared sense that we are living through multiple kinds of intertwined crises today from climate to care, to the carceral state, to inequality, to the fabric of our democracy, and that law has something to do with how we got here and that understanding that um, uh, will be important to changing it. Right? And so, of course, a lot of our work revolves around this concept of political economy, but one important piece of that work, and here's the first piece of connection, is that um, a lot of people think of the economy and they think, you know, factories or the stock market, something like that, right? They have a kind of a, a picture of the economy as some sort of separate, I'm going to say a big word, reified thing um, that, that acts on us and that we defer to. But part of what we're trying to do is challenge that idea of the economy. And one piece of that is where do we think the economy happens? What's connected to the economy? And so while there are a lot of places in law schools where we don't talk about the economy at all, like many classes about criminal procedure or criminal law, um, there's a lot of work that scholars are doing under the LPE framework to try to say, hey, there's a relationship between um, mass incarceration and the economy. And we have to understand that relationship. We have to understand how in the period of the last 30 years where we talked about rolling back the state and liberating markets, we also rolled out the state, right? And we built a massive enterprise um, at the border and also inside of the country um, that operates um, in ways that I think we need to better understand and so that we can better contest them in ways that are intertwined with the logic of making jobs more precarious, degrading our welfare state, um, and broadly um, uh, making many of us more subject to the power of uh, markets. So, so one piece is that connection substantively, but the other piece is the spirit of the work that you're doing and trying to bring participatory law scholarship into our awareness and make more of it possible for others. There's a, both an organizing spirit and a spirit that challenges a lot of conventional ways that we operate and talk in law schools about who an expert is, about who understands how law works. And that's very much, uh, I think, a commitment that is shared by people working on law and political economy because the current ways that we work in law schools and that law operates uh, over people um, you know, we have to sort of challenge those ideas. We often talk in LPE world about democratizing the economy, but if you mean that seriously, you mean that many, 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 many more people need to have authority within our legal institutions and need to have authority over how we order things like the economy. And so I see this as really intertwined with and, and bringing forth a, a shared um, a project and commitment trying to, um, trying to open up the world of scholarship to more kinds of expertise and um, theorization that will really have impact in the world because it's organized around the problems that really most affect people. So I'm gonna hand it over now to our incredible student organizers and uh, let them take it away. Thank you so much, Amy, um, for situating us um, and situating this panel. 
Um, we'll first do some quick intros. Um, so first, I'd like to introduce Professor Monica Bell. Monica Bell is Professor of Law and Associate Professor of Sociology at Yale University. She works at the intersection of law and sociology using sociological tools to explore a wide variety of legal questions, mostly those focused on race and class inequality. Some subject matters that Bell has focused on include policing, structural and interpersonal violence, safety and security, welfare and public benefits, and housing, residential, housing and residential segregation. Her scholarship has appeared in numerous publications, including the Yale Law Journal, the American Journal of Sociology, and the Law and Society Review. Professor Bell has received recognition for her scholarship, teaching, and mentorship, such as the 2019 Yale Law Woman Faculty Excellence Award, a 2021-2022 Visiting Scholar Fellowship at the Russell Sage Foundation, and is a Truman Scholar and Mitchell Scholar. Uh, professor Rachel Lopez is an Associate Professor of Law at the Thomas R. Klein School of Law at Drexel University. Her research primarily focuses on state responsibility for mass atrocity, transitional justice, and the carceral state, with a particular focus on Eighth Amendment jurisprudence. This academic year, she's in residence at Princeton University as a Fellow in Law, Ethics, and Public Policy. She's also held visiting fellowships at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, the Lauterpacht Center for International Law at the University of Cambridge, the Orville H. Shell Jr. Center for International Human Rights, law, Human Rights at Yale Law School, and the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law. In 2016, Professor Lopez researched transitional justice in Guatemala and Spain as a Fulbright Scholar. Professor Lopez is the founder of Participatory Law Scholarship, an emerging genre of legal scholarship written in, in collaboration with authors who have no formal training in law, but rather expertise in its function and dysfunction through lived experience. This approach to legal scholarship is grounded in the belief that the experience of being marginalized by the law uniquely positions someone to critique it. Of special note, as well as the Participatory Law Fund, a fund devoted to supporting the production of participatory law scholarship. The fund provides awards for research and academic activities to the co-authors of PLS without formal legal training in recognition of their contributions to this emerging genre of scholarship. We also note that the first ever participatory law symposium, which will take place later this week on March 29th, organized by the Virginia Law Review, the symposium will bring together several participatory law authors to discuss theories of knowledge, uh, important questions about the role of legal scholarship in social change and the movement's role in developing the law. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Ghani and Rel. So first, Terrell Carter Wolfolk, also known as Rel, was born and raised in West Philadelphia. After serving over three decades of a life without parole sentence, Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf commuted his sentence and Terrell was released in July of 2022. While behind bars, Terrell Carter was a hospice volunteer and authored three novels, several short stories, poems, and personal essays. He co-created a writing exchange program consisting of men who are incarcerated in a state prison outside of Philadelphia. He's also a facilitator and creator of several workshops ranging in topics from creative writing to social justice issues. He's a graduate of Villanova and currently pursues a master's in creative writing from Drexel University. He's an active member of Temple University's Inside Out Think Tank and a husband, father, and grandfather. Mr. Carter has dedicated his life toward bringing an end to the inhumane practice of condemning men, women, and children to die in prison and to restore hope in those who have had it stripped away. And finally, I'd like to introduce Kempis Songster, also known as Ghani, who is the transformative healing and restorative justice manager at the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth, or CFSY. In this role, he helps CFSY to advance transformative and healing justice models across the nation. He's also a founding member of Right to Redemption, the Redemption Project, and the Coalition to Abolish Death by Incarceration, as well as a co-founder and director of Ubuntu Philadelphia. Since his release in 2017, after 30 years in prison, starting when he was 15 years old, Ghani has emerged as an outspoken voice and visionary in Philadelphia's movement to end mass human caging and to create transformative and restorative responses to harm and violence. During his first three years out, he worked at the, as the healing justice organizer for the Amistad Law Project, during which time he co-created and hosted Amistad's Move It Forward podcast. 
Ghani spent another three years at the Youth Art and Self-Empowerment Project as leader of Philadelphia's first restorative justice diversion program for youth called Healing Futures. And Rel and Ghani are the founders of Right to Redemption, or R to R, which we'll be discussing. It's a committee that advocates from the premise that no human being is irredeemable, and that although redemption is a deeply personal process, the state and law should facilitate rather than obstruct the path to second chances. And so thank you all so much for being here, and thank you to our panelists. Uh, first, we're splitting the panel into two sections. First, we're going to begin by introducing PLS in practice, uh, starting with a word from our co-authors, Ghani and Rao, who'll be doing a spoken performance, followed by a Q&A style conversation between us moderators and our panelists. And then for the second half, uh, we're going to move into a broader level discussion of movements of scholarship within the academy. And here we're going to consider how PLS as a research methodology fills a gap in the literature. We'll discuss PLS as a movement within and outside the academy, its contributions, benefits, and challenges. So with that, I'll hand it back to Chisato. Thank you. Okay, so we'll start with Ghani and Rel's reading and spoken word performance. Um, this piece I'm about to read is from um, an article that we wrote called Regarding Us a Death Penalty. It was dark, always dark. The only light, a pale glow flickering off the walls emanating from the 40-inch TV mounted on the wall. Then there was the smell, a pungent stench of decay and disease, always there, not overpowering, but just enough to stay with you always. An extremely lonely place filled with a fear and an expectation of being alone forever. I have been a hospice volunteer for a few years at this point, called to duty to serve my brothers in need. Our numbers had grown over the years from a handful to over a couple dozen, which was good because it gave us time to decompress. We were guardians against fear, ushers to the unknown. It was a difficult post because it called for us to provide comfort to people we knew and loved who were making a transition from this life to whatever lies beyond. I had no way of knowing at the time that upon signing up for this program that it would allow an opening to the unemotional plane that I had that I had been hiding in. But it would take still take it would still take a little time for me to totally extradite myself from its fear. Being a hospice volunteer in the bowels of the beast exposed me to human frailty laid bare by disease. I had to sit by while the people I love slowly begin to break down, their physical and mental selves withering away to nothing. For the first time, I truly understood the finality of my sentence. Nobody wants to die alone. There is a palatable fear that exists when a human being knows that the end is near and there is no one there to see them through. I've held hands, I've sang songs, I've sat quietly, my presence just enough to provide a little solace. But what happens when there is no one, when human beings are hidden from sight in dark rooms that smell of rot and death, soil, knowing that they're going to die an undignified death, craving a little human compassion, but the only people around who can give it are strangers who think they deserve to die alone. Thank you, Rel. What I'll share is the mission statement that we wrote at SCI Greater Ford, that's State Correctional Institute of Greater Ford, the sixth largest penitentiary in the country. We wrote this uh, mission statement after um, months and months of debate, debating what would be the best mode of procedure for this new formation that we came up with. Right to redemption or R2R is a crusade to end the sentencing of human beings to life in prison without the possibility of parole or death by incarceration in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, particularly, and in the US at large. R2R aims to affect 
the passing of a retroactive parole eligibility for lifers bill to bring Pennsylvania's sentencing schemes and policies toward felony cases in harmony with the evolving standards of decency of the global community. R2R believes and appeals to the United Nations Human Rights Council to recognize that the damnation of a human being of any age to spend the rest of his or her natural life in prison without even the possibility of a parole hearing review is a negation of the distinctly human capacity for redemption, a denial of the individual's core humanity and a violation of an inalienable human right. R2R will tout the unsung wonders of the many men and women sentenced to life without parole who have convicted themselves to a life of sacrifice and service and have become agents of restoration in the communities they have wounded to afford aired souls the opportunity to continue writing themselves through serving humanity instead of just serving time is a key step in humanity's march toward a more livable world. Therefore, R2R calls on forces of goodwill everywhere to come together, consolidate, and champion the human right to redemption and dignity in any case or circumstance to advance the idea of forgiveness for those deemed worthy and to help the criminal legal system and the public see the rightness of embracing the prospect of redemption over unceasing retribution. Thank you so much um, for the, those performances and for reading those out loud. Um, we are now going to move into um, a bit of a discussion about um, the forthcoming piece regarding the other death penalty um, and some questions um, for all of the panelists. Um, so regarding the other death penalty is forthcoming in the Columbia Law Review. I'll read a bit of the abstract, which explains the article as a response to Randall DeFalco's recent book, Invisible Atrocities, which explores the function and of the aesthetics of violence in international law. In the book, DeFalco questions international criminal law's preference for punishing spectacular demonstrations of violence rather than more banal bureaucratic actions that cause mass scales of suffering and misery. The book resonated with the co-authors of this essay because they have seen the same dynamic at work in U.S. criminal law with respect to society's views on two forms of the death penalty enacted by the carceral state, capital punishment and life without parole. Um, so just introducing regarding the other death penalty, um, and just a couple questions on that. Um, so for the co-authors, what was the inspiration behind writing regarding the other death penalty and how did your personal experiences come to shape the piece? So we're going to kind of go, go, go down the line here a bit. I wanted to sort of step back for a moment here and give you a sense of almost you're sort of sitting in the seat that I was um, about four years ago with this sense of the deep inspiration that Ghani and Rel have left with you all. And that's really where this piece, piece starts in many respects, because hearing from them as a human rights attorney um, in so many ways flipped my world upside down. In law school, much like you might be doing, I participated in a clinic uh, in Texas that was an anti-death penalty uh, clinic. And I thought that I was doing something that was so... Um, incredibly important, so deeply human to get people off death row. And I never thought that these people, what we were celebrating was their death behind bars. Even when we were successful in our cases, we were leaving them to the exact conditions that Rel described here. And I felt like my world and meeting Rel and Ghani and so many of our colleagues who sadly are still behind bars opened up a world for me and really exposed to me how I was blind to so much of what I thought I knew. And so that's really the start of participatory law scholarship and in, in particular this piece regarding the other death penalty. It really is almost in some ways speaking to my former self, an anti-death penalty advocate and sort of the harm that I un unconsciously did. Um, so for me, um, 
the piece that I read earlier was my experience in the penitentiary and working as a hospice volunteer. And so in, in composing and in, in co-authoring um, regarding the other death penalty, I kind of drew from that experience because I don't think people realize that life without parole is just as final as a death sentence. And so I sat in rooms with people who took their last breaths. I watched people waste away. So that was kind of my inspiration to contribute to the article because, and it's not, I'm not here to compare, you know, which condemnation is the cruelest because I think they both can be cruel on their own merits. And I just, I just thought it would be good for me and for the people who have died behind those penitentiary walls to kind of expose the truth of what life without parole really is. Thank you so much. And I know both of you already kind of touched on this, um, but because it is the focus of the article, and I think it's really helpful for all of us to think about it as law students, Rachel, as you mentioned, just thinking about our experiences and what we're really advocating for. Can you explain a little bit more about why you describe life without parole as death by incarceration? Thank you, Chisato. Um, when I was sentenced in uh, 1987 to life without parole. I had no idea, well, if, as, as a young, as a, as a 15 year old, you really can't even fathom what that really meant. It wasn't until years into that sentence that it really dawned on me that I was sent here to die, right? Um, and I'm quite sure Rel and pretty much everyone I know who was similarly sentenced, they had that kind of awakening to that reality, that this is a sentence unlike in other states where life sentence might mean 20 years or 25 years or any number of years, and then you're eligible to see the parole board. That's not the case in Pennsylvania and some other states in the country. You know, you're sent to prison effectively to die. That's it. There is no parole eligibility. There is no opportunity to even come before a responsible board of people, not necessarily to guarantee your release, but just to be considered or heard so a determination could be made as to whether or not you're ready to return to the community. There is no such opportunity. People who, and we know people who have earned their bachelor's, master's, and PhDs serving a life without parole sentence, right? And they are treated the same way, deprived of any opportunity to be considered as someone who had spent their entire sentence getting in fights, getting in trouble, spending time in the hole. So there is no opportunity. The only way you come from out of a life without parole sentence in Pennsylvania and a few other states from a life without parole sentence is either you somehow miraculously overturn your conviction in, through your appellate process, through some greater miracle like REL, get the governor to sign off on your application for, for clemency, you escape, you know, you go over the wall, under the wall. And the final way is come out in a zipped up in a bag with a tag on your toe. Those are the only ways you come from under a life without parole sentence in Pennsylvania. And so we made a determination that we were no longer going to use a term as beautiful as the word life, because we know when we hear, hear the word life, what that means that we were not going to apply such a beautiful term to something or a sentence that's so associated with death and finality as a life without parole sentence. And so we decided to call it death by incarceration. And some other, some other um, motivational factors went into that too, which we'll probably talk about next. 
Thank you so much. Um, and I think as many people in the audience know, Connecticut has a very similar scheme of death by incarceration. So this is very, very relevant for many of us who hope to practice um, in Connecticut or in clinics, things like that. Um, okay. So thank you for sharing. Um, and regarding the other death penalty it makes it clear that the anti-death penalty movement pitched life without parole as a more human sentence than capital punishment. Um, how should movements seeking to do good make themselves aware of the consequences of their proposals? What role does PLS play in this? Yeah, that was um, that was the other motivating factor, because one of the one of the reasons, um, one of the things we discovered quite early when debating with each, with each other and figuring out what are the challenges to parole eligibility. How is the public, why is this such an unpopular um, sentence, right? Because for the most part, all the support was going to, you know, people on death row. And, and that's rightfully so, because this, you know, literally the, their hourglass is, is running out faster than anybody. And, um, but we, the, the, the most peculiar discovery was that the strongest proponents or some of the strongest proponents and advocates of life without parole, the sentence that Rel and I were sentenced to, were opponents of the death penalty. You know, and we, we, we didn't know that before, you know, but we were discovering now that people who were opposing the death penalty were actually advising legislators, you know, recommending to legislators life without parole using terms like it's the more humane sentence. It's a more um, humane alternative to the death penalty. And it, it was peculiar because we didn't want to engage in a public ideological struggle with people that we saw as our ideological ilk. These were our comrades. These were our friends. We believed that the death penalty is wrong on its, on its moral and philosophical face. And we thought that that was all they would need to prove that not necessarily throw us under the bus to make the point, right? When I say us, people serving our life without parole sentences. So we didn't think, but we didn't think that they were doing it out of malice or because they just didn't care about us. We really thought that like a lot of people out there, they didn't really fully appreciate the finality of life without parole. They didn't really, they didn't really get the gravity of this sense. So we say, you know what? We're going to have to convey this. We're going to have to convey this. And the way we do it is to discontinue using the innocuous term of life without parole or life to describe what it is we're dealing with. That's why we decided to call it death by incarceration, because I don't mean to belabor it, but taking a page out of Frederick Douglass's book, you know, when he was addressing the people in the audience in that speech, what to the slave is the 4th of July, right? When they criticized him for not using more intellectual arguments to make his point. And he said, no, I will use the severest language I can command because I, if I have to convince you that this is wrong, you know, I'm not gonna waste my time. And he said, quote, and this is his quote as I remember it, at a time like this, Scorching irony, not convincing argument is needed. Oh, had I the ability and could I reach the nation's air, I would today pour out a fiery stream of biting ridicule, blasting reproach, stern rebuke, and withering sarcasm. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the earthquake, the storm right? The hurricane, the, the, the feeling of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled. The conscience of the nation must be awakened and its crimes against God and humankind must be proclaimed and denounced, end quote. And so it's from that page. We say, you know what? Let's attach ourselves to that legacy, the legacy of not mincing any words, and, 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 and calling it what it needs to be called, you know, because maybe public consciousness and certainly the consciousness of our comrades who were fighting to end the death penalty, 
definitely needs to be jarred and awoken to the gravity of what we're dealing with as people condemned to die in prison. Thank you so much. Um, and Ghani, you advocated before the United Nations that life without parole or death to incarceration amounts to inhumane punishment and a violation of human rights. Last November, the UN Human Rights Committee concluded its review of US compliance with the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights and recommended for the first time um, ever that the United States set in place a moratorium on life without parole sentences. How is this recommendation a product of movement-centered legal scholarship and advocacy, and how can scholarship do more to advance this mission? Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you for that, Chisato. When Rail and Rachel and I put our minds and hearts and spirits together to write Redeeming Justice, we didn't know it would have the impact that it did. You know, um, we wanted to make the case to the world that the right to redemption is a human right based on international law and push against the boundaries of the legal codification of condemnation. We were hoping that we would be able to leverage the weight of international law in the fight to end death by incarceration over here. We had no idea that we would also be able to soon leverage global solidarity because it hadn't been built yet. But when organizations, when people started to catch wind of the peace redeeming justice, organizations started coming together, grassroots organizations such as um, who had already been working together on different things, but decided to come together to, to follow the first ever complaint against death by incarceration in the United Nations. Organizations such as the uh, Abolitionist Law Center, the Amistad Law Project, the Center for Constitutional Rights, RAP, Releasing Aging People in Prison, the Sentencing Project, Right to Redemption, um, Drop LWAP in, 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 in California, and a few other organizations came together and filed a, uh, an, a complaint, I think 164 something pages or something like that to the United Nations. And then from that complaint, it increased opportunities to address the United Nations. I went to New York um, to address the United Nations. Um, some of us addressed the United Nations virtually. And then on October 17th, a delegation of us actually went abroad to Geneva to address the Human Rights Council in person about death by incarceration. And this was the first time that they actually issued a statement. The United Nations issued a statement to the U.S., 13 pages long, charging U.S. the U.S. with violating these distinct human rights for sentencing people to death by incarceration. And this was the first time that the term death by incarceration was used globally, right? And so it meant a lot to us because this was a quote, a statement that was birthed behind prison walls, and now it, it's, it's, it, it went global. You know, and so these organizations were all grassroots organizations. They were movement or they were organizations that were members of the movement ecosystem, right? A lot of them like Abolitionist Law Center was founded. The idea for the formation of the Abolitionist Law Center came from behind the walls. And so a lot of these organizations were founded in the movement. They were created in the movement. They were movement formations. The delegation that went over there included directly impacted people, people who were formally condemned to die in prison, as well as family members of people who were condemned, as well as family members who lost loved ones to violence, going over to the United Nations to address the, on, on this issue. And so this was very much birthed by the movement um, from both sides of the walls. And the way legal scholarship could help to support this and promote this and push this forward is to continue to look for ways to bring the human human rights law into this conversation, right? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Ghani. Um, and for, for the co-authors, what impact do you hope regarding the other death penalty will have broadly? Yeah. This is for me. Um, for me, so um, for me, it's about bringing awareness um, because the way PLS works, it provides context 
in the in scholarship that traditionally lacks it. And context is important because everybody has a story to tell, no matter what walk of life you come from or how different you may be from someone else. When you have an opportunity to read their story, you can see there will be something in that story that you can relate to. And that's what I like to call a human thread. And when you see those human threads, it's easier to see yourself in other people, right? Which allows empathy. And so this kind of scholarship, which um, regarding the other death penalty is, will allow that. It allow people to empathize with things that they have no experience in. And with that empathy comes a different kind of perspective. So that's my hope for the future. Part of my role at Drexel is I, I teach a legal clinic. And many of our cases um, are cases that involve representing incarcerated individuals. And sometimes in that work, I feel it the work can be deeply meaningful, particularly when people like Rel come home. And it can feel in many ways as if um, those victories can fill you for a lifetime. But what I think that the, you know, sometimes scholarship can feel a little empty in comparison, I guess is what I'll say, right? It doesn't have the same visceral impact. But part of what I've realized in my now 15 years of practice is that so much of what influences those individual cases is the broader narratives that operate in all of our minds. And a piece of this work and why I put so much energy into this type of legal scholarship is it's really about changing the narratives and the scripts that run through people's mind when they are adjudicating cases like Rel's and Ghani's cases. Instead of picturing a super predator or a welfare queen, they see individuals and the humanity comes through. And I think this is a piece that sometimes as a practitioner, I didn't have the tools to grapple with because I was only representing one individual. I could only reach a limited number of people through that case. Legal scholarship is distinct. It creates a place where you can really inform the scripts that inform the law, the philosophies that undergird the law that create repressive and uh, subordinating laws really, I think, demand a critical legal imagination and that critical legal imagination, really I see legal scholarship as a place where that can flourish. And what I mean by that is thinking about not just the law that exists on the page, but what are the values, priorities, and scripts and narratives that are going into that? And how do we challenge those? Thank you, Rachel. I think those comments on uh, the critical legal imagination really help make a bridge to the second part of our discussion where we um, want to know about how we can use PLS to connect the legal academy to social movements. Um, so Rel and Ghani have introduced uh, R to R, the right to redemption to us, and I want to put a few other things on the table. Um, first is just a reiteration of the definition of PLS. Um, so it's we can set PLS, it seems, in an intellectual history of critical race studies and movement lawyering traditions. Um, PLS seeks to produce legal scholarship through collaboration with authors without formal legal training, but with extensive expertise in the law through lived experiences. And another thing I want to put on the table here is the article, If the Subaltern Could Speak. And I'll read out the abstract. I think it could be helpful for the discussion to come. So Terrell Carter grew up only a stone's throw from Drexel University, and the institution of higher learning where the other co-author of this article, Rachel Lopez, would find her academic home years later. Even as a boy, Terrell remembers feeling like other institutions that were miles away, like the state correctional institution at Gratterford, where he would spend most of his adult life, were far much more proximate. Paradoxically, he later came to learn that behind the walls of institutions like Drexel, academics like Rachel would develop ideas and produce knowledge that would shape his fate and define his existence behind other walls. Through participatory law scholarship, legal scholarship written in collaboration with those without formal legal training, 
quote, expertise in laws and justice through a lived experience, Terrell and Rachel seek to explore and dismantle the walls upon walls that divide the ideals of law from the lived experience of it. So I want to ask um, Rachel and Raul, the authors, if, if the subaltern could speak. So you write about Drexel, uh, where both of you work and near where Rail grew up, and its extractive and displacing relationship with the communities surrounding it. You write that, quote, academic institutions often displace the very marginalized communities that are the subject of their scholarship in the name of uh, fostering knowledge and innovation, end quote. This material displacement is connected to another form of violence, academic displacement. Um, I was wondering if you could speak more on this and the kinds of reckoning that universities need to have about their epistemic and material relationships to the communities that they're a part of. It, um, so, yeah, that's absolutely correct. I grew up a, a stone's throw away from Drexel. Actually, um, when I was a child, um, Drexel University's football field was like directly down the street and it was a part of my extended playground. Um, we used to like go to the uh to the football field. They had tennis courts on there too, so we used to like steal the tennis balls and use them for baseball. Um, and so that community that I grew up with is where I got my sense of community from. Um, you know, I grew up in the '70s and the '80s, and community was different back then. Um, you know, everybody knew each other. It was close knit. Um, you know, we were like a big extended family. And then in the 90s, I went to prison and I stayed there for 30 years. And when I came home, I rode through that community and no one's there anymore. It's all gone. I mean, some of the buildings are still standing. Some of those three-story houses are, are you know, they're just occupied by different people. Um, you know, part of the my extended playground, the church that stood there is, is gone, is replaced by wine and spirits and apartment buildings. Um, and so when I drive through that neighborhood, I, I get a, a a sense or it's a weird feeling that I get. Um it's a sadness mixed with nostalgia. Um, and I, and I was telling Rachel and Ghani this earlier, it's like, um, you drive past an old girlfriend's house that you really used to like, but she doesn't live there anymore. And so when you ride past the house, you're like, damn, I wonder what she's doing. And so it's kind of like that feeling that I get when I drive through that old neighborhood. Um, and I, and I understand that, you know, the people who are there, they're scattered all over the the country actually you know some of them even left the state um but we still have that sense of community but the space that we occupied is no longer there and i can remember as a as a as a young boy the grown-ups in the neighborhood talking about drexel like i knew what drexel was drexel was like the old man that lived down the street that never came out his house Right, he was a stranger in the part of the community that we lived in. And if you sat on the steps, he threw hot water on you. That's the feeling that I got from Drexel. Um, and so I used to hear the adults talking about displacement and gentrification as a child, not understanding what any of it meant back then. But as I got older and I came and when I came home from the penitentiary and I'm driving through this neighborhood and everybody's gone, I said, Okay, this is what they were talking about. And so um, that was violence to me because what I learned about community, that community that I loved, that I was a part of, that, that, that nurtured me was no longer there. And most of the people who, who, who live there, who, are, who don't anymore, were forced to move because of the tax increases. They could no longer afford to pay the taxes on their home, so they were forced to sell. Um, and, you know, it was a, it was replaced by, you know, there wasn't just Drexel, it was University of Penn too, I, I have to say. Um, University of Penn probably more so because it was a little closer. 
but those institutions of higher learning kind of force the people in the communities away. And I kind of want to just add, I, I spent some time here as a fellow in New Haven, and I think some of the dynamics that Rel discussed are also important to think about in our situation and on our positionality here as well. I want to sort of um, take a minute to talk about what Rel is describing and his experience here and put it through multiple layers of analysis. As academics, so much of our work is spent speaking for marginalized people from communities like Rel. In fact, my university often sends researchers to research the communities that surround Drexel's campus as a part and parcel of our stock and trade of research. And we prescribe things that we think will make their situation better. In doing this, right, we are speaking, telling essentially a population of people that we know what is best for them. At the same time that our universities and, and the piece, uh, if the subaltern can speak, goes into a deep dive into this history where the universities, Penn and Drexel, join together creating proposals to get tax relief and other benefits for bringing innovation into the neighborhood. They cleared eight blocks of the neighborhood surrounding Drexel's campus close to where uh, Rel grew up um, in the name of fostering innovation, in the name of bringing uh, intelligence and knowledge to that area. What does that tell you? That they did not believe that there was innovation and knowledge that already existed in those places. And so that's what this piece is really trying to grapple with. How are we in these academic spaces perpetrating what Rell describes as a violent experience for his community? So on this note, and I wanna open this up to the entire panel and bring Monica into the discussion. Um, what role do you see um, your scholarship playing in movements or other forms of activism? Like what kind of communities, scholarly or activists do you see your uh, work in conversation with? I hear Monica's voice before I go. I don't know that my voice needs to be heard, but um, so, uh, especially because of what my answer is to that question, which is, um, I think, let me put it this way, I don't consistently approach scholarship with um, an idea that is contributing to a movement. And I just want to be clear about that. So so for me, um, really my, my entree into thinking about legal scholarship at all was just noticing how precisely what we've been talking about the entire time. Like there's this large legal apparatus that is acting on various marginalized communities with no voices, no recognition of the expertise, <laughs> like just really no attention to what people already know. Um, and it's, and so, and, but I'll, for me, it's not, I'm not m like kind of movement motivated as much as I am kind of marginalized voice motivated. And I think that's an important distinction because I think sometimes in rooms like this, we get very caught up in like, what does like a specific movement organization think or like who are the right people to talk to in the movement organization? And there's a lot of wisdom of people sitting in their homes who have no involvement with the movement, but who have a lot of lived experience. And so that is really what drives my scholarship. And I hope that contributes to change but I don't see that as necessarily kind of like these are the people who I'm like the people I'm accountable to are the people who I like spend time with and whose stories I hear more so than like a movement per se. But hey, can I I like to like you express something that I've been feeling for a while and you did a real good job at it because I I I I, I never was motivated by movement either um actually I, i'm surprised sometimes when people kind of like talk about some of the things that that i do in the sense of it being a part of a movement because for me it was just strictly voices that were silent i wanted to lift up that's all it was about for me um um like like you know because penitentiary walls not only um, shield you from sight, but they muffle sound. 
And so, because we've talked about all kinds of issues, we shout them out, holler, and argue at each other about them, but they're contained within those walls. And so PLS gave us an opportunity to let our voices be heard. Um, this, if the subaltern could speak, I felt like um, I was representing a community that no one listened to. And here was an opportunity for the world to hear about what's happening on 43rd and Let Low. And so that was my motivation. It really wasn't motive, movement building, maybe a little activism, but not movement. Because that seemed large to me. And that could be overwhelming. So I focused on what I knew and the people that I knew and what seemed tangible to me. Okay, I can talk about this. I can write a little bit. So let me write about this. And hopefully people than other, my, other than myself and Ghani and Rachel will be able to read it and get a different kind of perspective. When I think about the work that we do, um, as far as the question of what role the, the work I do play, thinking about the work that we do as a team, you know, with through PLS and the kind of, you know, spirit that we brought to create something like redeeming justice regarding the other death penalty and all the other pieces, but also, you know, my, 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 my role as transformative healing and restorative justice manager um, for the campaign for the fair sentencing of youth and all the other roles that I've had in the six years that I've been home and, and for the 30 years that I've been in prison, which has been basically advocating for, for something different, for a more livable world, for a world that works for everybody. I, um, I want to, I think it, it's important that I lift up first and first, first and foremost, that that work is not about painting people who've caused harm like myself as um, like e erasing the fact that we were directly involved in harming our communities and we have a lot to atone for. You know what I'm saying? That's not what this work is about. This work is not like trying to just brush away the gravity of, especially since we're talking about the loss of human life for the most part, when we talk about life without parole sentences. And by the way, not everybody in America that had a life without parole sentences killed someone, right? You actually have people serving that sentence who didn't commit a homicide. Some of it might have been for, uh, there might have been their third offense on a three strikes you're out um, law. Or, you know, you had situations where you even had children serving uh, death by incarceration sentences who didn't kill anybody. So not everyone serving a life without parole sentence kills someone. And you also have a lot of people that's innocent in prison. I am not speaking as such a person, but I know a lot of people who are innocent. And so I think it's important to lift that up first and foremost for me. I, I was directly involved in causing a harm. You know, I hurt someone. You know, I caused the loss of a human life, right? I just want to lift that up. And, and I know a lot of people who carry the burden of that kind of guilt. What we're talking about with redeeming justice is that even people who've committed the ultimate trespass right, such as myself, such as the taking of a human life, are more than the worst thing that they've ever done, right? We are, to, to, to condemn us to death by incarceration is basically to say that we can never rise above our, our lowest state. We can never get to the point where we want to be more socially responsible. We want to be more ecologically and environmentally responsible because we're always that person, right? We believe that death by incarceration and just the whole concept and culture of condemnation forecloses the capacity for human transformation. 
right? And every one of us have something to offer the world to offset a lot of the things that our communities are dealing with right now, right? And redeeming justice is about that. It's about lifting up that human potential for transformation and change. And as a transformative healing and restorative justice manager, or just somebody that's with the campaign for the fair sentencing of youth who believe that no child is born bad, no child is born bad, and that everyone has the capacity to change. Everyone might not exercise it, but we all have that capacity, like Rel articulates in a recording in his response to Justice Alito's question, is there any human being that's, that's beyond redemption? We believe that no one is beyond redemption, right? Um, and so I just want to lift that up. And so the work, the work is, is when I approach the work, it's from that type of consciousness, right? It's a, I'm very sensitive to that. I'm sensitive to the need for community to hear from us, the need for people who've done wrong to realize that, hey, we can be accountable, right? We can fulfill our obligations to the community that we've hurt. We can fulfill our obligations to the world. We can discharge a profound sense of duty to the universe that we've hurt, right? And it's from that perspective that we approach the work. And so that I approach the work anyway, on a personal level. And I do believe that the gap that this kind of scholarship fills is by lifting up those voices more, bringing in the voices more of people that's on the inside that have caused harm, right? that have experienced the harsh impact of the law in ways that the law never articulates, right? So that we could become more conscious, those who write the law, those who interpret the law, those who arbiter the, arbit are arbiters of the law, those who enforce the law and defend the law, we can become more sensitive in the kind of laws that we create and force. We wanna, you know, hopefully that we can begin to create laws that foster a healing justice as opposed to a hanging justice. A law that is about appreciating the value of every human being as opposed to a law that treats human beings as disposable. You know, that's, that's the gap that I think that we could fill with this work. Thank you so much to all of you. Um, especially Ghani for these moving words. I want to zoom out and uh, discuss PLS uh, more in specific now. And I think one of the, like the core innovative thing that PLS does is that it can um, overturn the kinds of power dynamics between formally trained legal scholars and non-formally trained scholars that um, we've been discussing in the reflections on uh, Drexel and also between academic institutions and communities. So with that in mind, like this possibility for the future of scholarship, I would love if our panel could reflect more on PLS in specific. Um, yeah, as Ghani began the conversation for us, the gap that PLS fills, the role it can play. And the thing I want to zoom in on specific is um, how each of you envision the um, role of formally trained legal scholars as well as non-formally trained legal scholars with lived experience um, within PLS. Um, I think it's important before I answer that question fully to understand that what exactly lived experience is. So it was more than just, you know, being in a penitentiary and feeling the weight of that space, right? Because me, Ghani, and a whole bunch of other guys that I knew, we were forced to go in the law library and read legal materials, you know, and coming into that space knowing absolutely nothing. Because, you know, um, I don't know if any of you are aware of this, but if you pour representation in the courts, it reflects that. And so we had to, we were forced, I mean, well, not all of us, but a lot of us were kind of forced to, you know, read books, 
about the law, no matter how born and uninterested we were in it as a field, we were kind of forced to do it because our circumstance demanded it. And so it's not that we don't have the capacity to analyze legalese. We have that capacity too because we studied for decades. I like to lift that up because a lot of people, when they think lived experience, just they just think of the impact of being in a prison cell and how that affects you. Um, so the... And I like to kind of like add to what Ghani was talking about as far as the gap PLS PLS fails fails. Um, for me, as I look at it, I think about PLS and and in the sense of this collaboration right, with people who aren't formally trained and people who are as a like a this symbiotic relationship where you know um, both parties kind of benefit um, because. The legalese is important, right? Because we are governed by laws. Um, so the theory is extremely important, but I think also just as important is the context that that lived experience provides. So in combination, it creates a more holistic scholarship, um, which is extremely important because if you have people who traditionally produce this scholarship, at least for me, it's a symbiotic relation, but more of like a, a parasitic symbiotic relationship um, where one side benefits and the other side is literally harmed. And so PLS, I think, maybe not fills that gap, but mitigates that. And so, um, yeah, that's that's how I see it. And maybe I can just talk about as the uh, academic partner in this, how I I was re re I was so this is so personal. But last night I just was reflecting on the journey that we have had together, the three of us. Um, and you know, Rel, like a little over a year and a half ago, was incarcerated writing this, you know, writing these pieces with us. And it's sort of baffling, sort of the almost level, I can't even articulate the level of awakening that I feel like I've had as a legal scholar. Sometimes it's so hard to feel as if legal scholarship has any grounding in reality because we're just looking at the page, right? We're looking at what other academics and professors think about what the law is. And it feels so divorced from the people that I know that I've represented or been in allyship with in movements, how they experience the law. And part of, I think, what is lacking, and there was a question around the link to critical legal studies here that I think is important. You are almost forced as a legal scholar to grapple with what people who are so distant from the law in terms of how it's experienced on a daily basis what they think and how they understand it and how the law impacts them. And this creates a vehicle through which academics can get closer to that reality where we're not just in conversation with one another. And I think that's the piece that is so important. We have blind spots just like any human beings. And this is a way for us to, to basically fill out a larger picture of what the law is. And so it's, it's I think in, in the sense that you say, a mutually beneficial and enlightening exchange yeah i'll uh, i'll jump in and add a little bit more to that because i think it helps underscore um like a few points i just thought it might be helpful to make one is uh legal scholarship that doesn't incorporate all of this context and what people actually live out is bad scholarship those are bad ideas and that i think that's really important to, to highlight here which is to say like it's not just like cool and interesting and um, radical to engage in the style of scholarship is actually what constitutes good scholarship. And that's really important for to be a take home point, I think. A second point is there isn't a, a continuum of participatoriness. So like if I were a student sitting in this room, I would be like, how am I supposed to find someone to write with? Like, and, and also like, 
is that the goal? Like, is it just to have like a, the window dressing of like an additional author, or is it going to be like a real productive organic experience? And not every style of participation can be in this form, but there, there's a continuum. I'm like, I have not done participatory law scholarship and I wouldn't hold myself out as that, but, um, but I, do I think it's really important. I mean, you were given the example of Drexel going into communities and like every university, this is true of every university, goes into communities, people study the marginalized people and then go back and write a thing. But one thing that's important to underscore about legal scholarship is that it traditionally has not even done that, which is kind of wild to think about. And so like, maybe we could do something that's not extractive in that domain, but, but but more on along that continuum and expanding that, I think is a really important kind of movement um, action. Um, and a third thing I'll just highlight uh, quickly here is um, to really underscore Rail's point about lived experience in a different way, because um, there are also lived experiences that people who sit in these rooms tend to have that produce the, the, the blind spots, right? Like, so we're all, operating in some realm of we have experience and we have forms of expertise. And so actually, I think one of the things that participatory, participatory law scholarship can do is to actually totally undo this kind of divide between here are the people with the formal training and here are the people without it, because, you know, we're all coming from different vantage points. And I think if we go back to early CLS, feminist scholarship, CRT, all of this what is our standpoint? <laughs> like, how are we how are we being reflexive about what we're bringing to the conversation? And that is what all of us need to do, no matter how, like, no, no matter what our origins are. And so I'll stop there. Just real quick to you, to the point you just made, I never really feel comfortable saying um, those who don't have formal training and those who do, that never really sits well with me. Yeah. But I just say it because, for lack of a better, yeah, vernacular. So I just wanted to, you made it comfortable for me to say that. Just now. <laughs> Thank you for that. Just to add, um, actually to put an exclamation mark on what Monica said. And, um, but go to the flip side of that, that until all of us see how we're directly impacted. Then we're going to have these conversations ad infinitum, right? And that's that's the line of, of the. I understand what we mean when we say it, when we talk about directly impacted and so on. And so we probably mean like the worst impacted or the most harshly impacted or the most harmed or something like. I think that's what we mean, anyway. But. We have to all be able to see how we're impacted by the kind of justice that we create and that we identify with. There is no amount of distance between that could exist between yourself and an injustice and you not be impacted by it, right? It could be on the other side of the world, and that's the kind of consciousness that I think it would behoove us to enter whatever work we do in, right? Wherever an injustice happen, it happens at in the world, there's no amount of distance where you can say, well, you know what? That's far enough away. I'm cool. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because just to go back to what Martin Luther King said, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I don't think that's just like... um some nice sounding proverb, you know what I mean? Nice, really hip and just, just cool to say. I really believe in that, right? Because I do believe that we are all connected. And until we see how we're all connected and how we're connected to the laws that we create, right? And how they harm or promote harm, then, then we'll, we run the risk of allowing laws to persist, that we fail to be able to gauge the true effectiveness of that law because we don't see how the laws harm the health and well being of communities. What the law, you know what I mean? And I think that's, for me, that's the end game of, 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 of PLS. 
right, where we're able to foster a new type of consciousness in the way that laws are created, and we can gauge the effectiveness of the law by how well those laws foster the health and well-being of communities and society at large. Now I'd like to open it up to the audience if you have questions for our panelists. Thank you so much for this. I'd love to hear you just say a little bit more about like, how you all envision PLS. Like, how do you think it's growing? How do you hope to protect it from becoming an extractive thing? And how, do you, I guess, more broadly, also hope that the society as a whole changes in response to them. Um, So my vision of the future for PLS is that it, it it can spread as far as it can spread. Um I know it's some it'd be some heavy lifting with it. I just recently um applied for um Soros grant because we want to start um an academy where we can not only bring people together but um you know, maybe do some workshops and trainings on some of the ethical issues that may arise because of the power dynamics that exist. And so we want to be able to kind of like um, mitigate those things because, you know, sometimes, you know, when people think they have an expertise and they're not really respecting or acknowledging the expertise you bring to the table, they they can, it's this like exoticism happens, right? Um, oh, look, the monkeys could, sp could speak, that sort of thing. And we want to like guard against that. You know, we want to create a situation where people recognize that everybody has a lived experience, like Ms. Bell just articulated, and that everybody, like nobody kind of like exists or was born in a vacuum. Right. And then they just went to law school and then that's all that they talk about. Like, no, people can't not be who they are and who they are is, is basically shaped by their life experience. And so you can't divorce yourself from that. And so everybody kind of brings that to the table. Right. And so, you know, um, we, we want to design some workshops and some training so that people can become aware of these things and develop a true symbiotic relationship as, a, as opposed to one that's said, but not really meant. I think a, a key piece of, I think a key piece of this as well as the compensation piece and yeah. ensuring that people are appropriately compensated. And one of the questions that we haven't gotten to is the challenges. And I think this is one of the unique challenges. There are not structures built within our law schools, within within universities to value this sort of expertise in the way that it deserves to be valued. And that's something that we continue to face and struggle um, on a regular basis. And also even amongst foundations, how do we convince them that this is something worth giving resources to, particularly when there seems to be, um, it's disfavored to give money to individuals is what I've sort of learned in, 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 in trying to Play this out. So I think there are real structural barriers, but that's really the goal is so that, you know, expertise is not just something where, in, in fact, one of the things when we give these talks is we always make sure that uh, Rel and Ghani get an honorarium for their time because it's a critical component of it. It's, it's, it's an important piece. We are compensated by for our expertise in many instances. And so that's a piece of it as well. Uh, thank you, Rachel. I mean, for the, uh, the compensation piece, you know, I certainly accept the the, uh, the expertise language and all of that, you know, because while I was in prison, I didn't have a mortgage to pay and bills, <laughs> you figure what I'm saying? And so I appreciate that now, but all jokes aside, um, I don't speak as an expert on anything personally. You know, I just want to lift that up. And I'm very intentional about putting that out there 
that I speak as a witness. That's it. You know, just as a witness, what I've borne witness to, um, not as an expert on anything. I don't see myself as um, having expertise, just experience on certain things. But I want to lift up um, what I think is a is a very important point. And I think what what will encapsulate it is these two quotes. Um, I usually start with this, but I missed an opportunity to start with this. The first quote is by Vincent Harding, um, the late great educator, social justice advocate, and contemporary of Martin Luther King, where he said that the entire course of human history leads us to right here and right now, wherever we find ourselves. And from right here and now, constrained but not determined by the past, we are obligated to imagine and create a future that could restore the innocence of the first day." End quote. And building right off of that and carrying on that vein and, 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 and that theme of innocence, which is what I want to dial in on, is Kingman Brewster himself, um, the president of, of Yale of, of, in the 1960s. On the, it's in the epitaph on his gravestone. And it says, quote, the presumption of innocence is not just a legal concept. In common law, as well as in common sense, it requires a generosity of spirit towards the stranger, the expectation of what is best rather than what is worst in the other, right? End quote. So I just want to, I hope that we ground ourselves and center ourselves in that kind of spirit, appreciating again that none of us were born bad and that innocence was a thing it was a characteristic of our very nature coming into this world along the way. Some of us might have lost it, some sooner than others, right? But it's always there. And perhaps if we had laws that spoke to the best in what it means to be human, right? And not just laws that condemns, right? We can actually create a world that's more conducive to creating more peaceful people, better people, right? For instance, just the way we're situated here today would have much preferred if we could have sat in a circle, right? As a community and not separate from each other and have a conversation as a family as people who, who share the same stake in these grave issues that we're talking about, where it's not as us here looking at you, talking at you, but where we're drawing on the collective wisdom of the room, right? This is the kind of model for what is necessary moving forward, you know? This is the prefigurative intervention aspect of PLS, right? Taking action at those points of assumption where beliefs are made and unmade, right? Where we give ourselves a glimpse of what's possible, at least in human relation and human scholarship first, but then in other areas, you know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like what our, our Buckminster Fuller said, and you know, if you don't know by now, I got a love for quotes. But um, he said, uh, and our book, Mr. Fuller was the, the, the architect and inventor from the late 1800s, early 1900s, when he said, you don't change things by fighting against the existing re reality. To change something, build a new model that renders the existing model obsolete, All right? And so that's what, we do this work in the spirit of prefiguring the kind of world that we want to see, right? A world that believes in the inherent innocence of everybody, 
right? I'm not talking about kumbaya and fluffy, you know, none of that, because people will hurt you and can hurt you, right? I'm a living testament of that, right? But when we talk about redeeming justice, right, a person is that redeemable quality is those seeds of innocence or those seeds of goodness that exist in everyone, right? That you don't hear in the legal cases that you read. You know what I'm saying? That you don't see behind the walls struggling to regain their humanity and moral rectitude, right? Allow those voices to come in, not just to advocate on their own behalf, or to make a case to say, look, I've changed, but just to be able to inform society on, look, here are some far-reaching ramifications for the laws that, that, that I've witnessed, right? From being condemned to death by incarceration like Rel was and left a daughter out there, right? 10 million children, for instance, growing up with families thrown away to prison, and those children are now 85% or seven times more likely to be incarcerated themselves if no positive intervention is made in their lives, right? Children of incarcerated mothers or condemned mothers are six times more likely to end up in the foster care system than even children of incarcerated fathers, more prone to school phobias and anxiety disorders and traumas and, and depression, three times more likely to, to be prone to depression and so on and so forth. The case can be made right, on many different fronts for reconsideration of some of the laws that we have created if we were to gauge its effectiveness by its impact on future generations, on communities, on families, and, and, and so on and so forth. And so I know that's um, kind of like a tirade and might seem discursive, but it's my attempt to, to tie together a very crucial point you know, which is the point that no child is born bad. Even those of us that commit the ultimate trespass, we do have a right to be more responsible and be accountable and play a part in helping to solve some of the issues that ail our communities, right? And accountability is not putting somebody in a cage forever. That's incapacitation and punishment but that's not synonymous with accountability. Accountability comes from within the person to want to make change and want to be an asset and a part of the solution as opposed to continually being a part of the problem. And no, no law says that I should be continually be a part of the problem and that I shouldn't be a part of the solution. I don't think that's fair, right? And also prefiguring the kind of community that we need to foster to find solutions to some of these issues, all right? Um, and that's the end of my little spill. <laughs> Thank you so much. We are out of time, but hopefully if our panelists have a moment, we can continue the conversation elsewhere. On behalf of LPE and what the YLS community, I just wanna thank our panelists, uh, Ghani, Rel, Rachel, Monica. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much.